Now, this lecture is based on learning unit 2, which is basically chapter 2 of the prescribed uh, textbook. Um, here in chapter 2, or learning unit 2, we are going to go through all the phases, uh, the five phases of the uh, 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 project life cycle. Though we are just going to jump some of them, but we are supposed to go through all of them. The reason being others are not that much important for now. We are going to touch them later. We got uh, five phases, like I said, initiation phase, planning phase, execution phase, monitoring, controlling, and evaluation phase. So remember again, this phase is not a standalone phase as such because you need to apply control on all those phases, you know, while you're busy with those other phases. And then you got the last one, which is termination phase. So basically what you're going to look at in this um, uh, uh, learning unit is initiation phase and termination phase. Yeah, the other three, we'll address them later. Okay, under initiation phase, um, it's very important that you have a statement of work uh, that is approved. This document defines the project to be, pla uh, to be planned and rules regulating how it has to be done. That is the project. The planning phase should be started only after the statement of work has been approved and the budget for the project plan and the schedule has been professionally settled. Project managers should identify the stakeholders who will assist in defining the project. Um, we will basically go through the components that you would find in a statement of work when we get to uh, chapter three. But basically, a statement of work will give you reasons as to why you're basically working on this particular project. Then secondly, under um, initiation phase, you're going to have the project specifications. Let's see, one of the steps towards successfully completing a project is that it has to be clearly specified at the outset. And all that will be done under initiation phase. Typically, you may find the following items in the specifications of a project. Number one, the identification of the organization for which you'll be basically uh, managing that particular project and the department that will be championing the project and the personnel that is involved in preparing the specifications. That is who in that particular department you need to liaise with or rather talk to. Then secondly, you're going to have the name or the number of the project that you're going to be working on. Um, okay, so that this particular number or the name, you know, every time you get some communication or rather communique that you send to whoever that is consent, you basically identify, I mean, you you mention that particular number or name. It's very important so that they know, you know, which project you're referring to. Then a definition of the objectives of the project, which is usually in the form of a deliverable. By now, we all know what is a, a deliverable. Then furthermore, you need basically to check the feasibility of the project because it would be useless for you to work on something that is not feasible. Um, because at the, end, at the end of the day, you won't uh, be able to complete that particular project. It, sometimes you may you know, be given a number of projects. You may have project A, B, C, D. So you need to select the most uh, you know, beneficial product that will benefit the organization or the, the most that is uh, uh, profitable for the organization. Firstly, you need to list all of them. 
And then you need to determine the opportunity or need for each project on the list. That is, you basically state why do we need this particular project? What need is it basically satisfying? Or which opportunity are we trying to exploit with this particular project? You basically mention for all three, if ever there are three, this is the need that we're trying to, 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 to satisfy here. This is the need we're trying to satisfy on that one, and so forth. And then you establish, um, estimate the delivery dates and budgets for each project. That is, if we work on this particular project, it's going to take us how long? And when can we start with this project? If we do opt to go for it, and then project B, uh, how much is it going to uh, cost us, and so forth. You do the same thing with all the other projects. And then you judge the feasibility in terms of the skills. Do you have the skills to do so? Or rather, do you have money to do so? Because you, now you know how much each project is going to cost. And then you check whether you do have money, basically, or rather the budget, to can carry out those projects. Then you establish the risk of possi uh, possible failure associated with each project. If I go for project A, what are the risks? Project B, what are the risks? You need to mention all of them. And it's very important that you're honest to yourself so that you mention each and every risk that is associ uh, associated with the project that you want to work on. And then once you're done with that, then you you review the project list, uh, goals and objectives for each and every one of them. And then you can then eliminate those that are not feasible according to your judgment. And then you select those or that one which you think you'll be able to, to undertake. Like we mentioned that uh, in the statement of work, that is the so, you need to have a list of stakeholders. You identify those people that have got an interest in the project that you'll be doing. Yeah, another thing that is important is that students should be able to can distinguish or rather yeah, differentiate between a shareholder and a stakeholder because these two things are not the same. Stakeholder is just somebody that has got an interest, even community. They could be stakeholders because they got an interest on in what you're doing. Uh, more so if you be, you know, working on a project that is in the township, you need to consult the community or else it won't be a success. We all know that. Projects are successful because the stakeholders involved in the project are satisfied. If everybody is satisfied, then they will support the project. It will definitely be successful. And the customer will pay for it because the customer is happy with what has been delivered to him. Therefore, it is essential to identify the correct and complete list of stakeholders at the outset and to keep the list up to date throughout the life cycle of the project. Example of stakeholders that you might have. Obviously, you might have a customer Customer establishes requirements, specifications, which are basically your quality and quantity metrics for the project reviews, project milestones, and deliverable. You need to know your customer. And then you got a sponsor. A sponsor is a functional manager sponsoring the project by means of an organizational or capital budget provides authority for the project to proceed, and shows that the project is aligned with organizational objectives and integrated with its processes. That is a sponsor. Basically, it's a senior manager in that particular organization. You need to have this person because he's the person uh, that will help you to remove whatever obstacles you might be faced with if you're working in that particular or working on a project for, for whichever particular organization you'll be working for. Then you got a project manager, which is basically the person that is leading 
uh, the, the project team and all the activities of the project. Then you got the project team, which could be composed uh, of seven to 12 people who are dedicated, motivated, and are needed to add value to the project initiatives and have specific skills and expertise to execute project activities. Then furthermore, we got uh, functional management because these people would provide organizational resources, including staff members, to support the project. They are therefore stakeholders as well. Then lastly, we are going to touch on the termination phase of the, the project. All projects have a defined beginning and an end. A project ends when it is terminated. It could be either because it has run its course, or maybe it has been decided that it is no longer viable or it's no longer needed, then you have to terminate it. The project must have achieved all its goals and objectives or it must be accepted as unsuccessful. Then you can terminate. We have a termination uh, process that you need to be aware of. Uh, number one, you need to issue a notice to complete or reject the project at 80 or 90 percent completion point or upon deciding to terminate the project prematurely, a notice should be sent to all consent, you know, stakeholders. What do they mean here? I would basically give uh, an example of maybe a project of building 10 RDP houses. <clears throat> if ever you're given that particular project, once you're done with eight houses or nine houses, they're complete, you need to issue a notice that you're about to finish because you're left with two houses or one, ho one house. It's important to do so, so that if ever those people need to start organizing some funds to pay you, they can start organizing that. And then you need to do a completion review, that is to identify and list all the work that has been completed successfully and, and identify and list all the remaining work, <coughs> sorry, items. Um, even though here it sounds like tautology, but um, it's part of the termination process, that is number three. You need to identify remaining work that is, all remaining work has to be identified. You explicitly list them, like, as to what is it that still needs to be done. Because sometimes it's possible that you build all 10 houses, like the structures are built, but there's still something remaining in maybe house one, and house two, and house four, and so forth, which can basically constitute maybe 20 or 10 percent you know, of the work that is remaining. And then you got a final completion plan. The f uh, final completion plan is you need to come up with a plan that indicates as to how you'll be completing whatever uh, work that is still remaining, you know, with time frames and whatever that you need to mention. You work out a plan, basically, as to how you're going to complete the remaining work. Then once you're done, you need to issue that notice of completion that you know what, you're done with the work. They say after the final items have been delivered and the project has been completed, according to the documentation of premature termination, a written notice has to be forwarded to the stakeholders. Then lastly, formal acceptance need to be basically undertaken. Um, the people that are building houses, they know they have this particular letter, they used to call it happy letter. 
that is once they are done with your house, they give you that happy letter, you check as to whether everything has been done accordingly, that is according to your specifications, then you sign and you say, I am happy with whatever that has been done. This is very important to, to basically do. And then it's, sometimes they may, um, you, you may be required to write a report, and more especially these days, almost everything that you do, you'll have to have a report <laughs> that you need to write and submit that explains everything uh, relating to the project that you worked on. Then they say, at a minimum, the following sections should be included. You need to have an executive summary. Executive summary is basically a short written overview of the project goals and, you know, and achievements. And then we got the next uh, component, which, which is achievements. Um, this comprise a comprehensive analysis of the extent to which the goals and objectives of the project were met. You explain everything in details. And then you're going to have a section where you recommend, you come up with your recommendations. This include a review of new tasks or issues that need future consideration. Like for instance, if you're busy working on this particular building that you know you, you are erecting, and you realize that it's a, it's a little bit challenging to carry on with the work if you don't have an engineer on site, because you know you you are faced with that challenge. So you can put in the recommendations that next time you work on this particular project, we recommend that you have an engineer on site. So those could be examples of recommendations. You can have a lot of them depending on whatever that you you are challenged with the time you're working on that particular project. Then you need to have acknowledgements. This means giving credit to those who made positive contributions towards the project. It's very important. It's actually an ethical thing to do to acknowledge, you know, the help that you you got from people that helped you or other people that basically contributed towards the completion of that particular project. Um, at that note, that is the end of our learning unit.